Um, so, Tiger's Mob, uh, published by Clandestine Press. Um, so, this is Stephen's bio from Goodreads. Whangarei, she's author of Memories of a Community Cop. Um, so, a delightfully written evocation of a life well lived. So, it's actually about Quinn Turton. Uh, how did you get to know Quinn? I haven't asked you that. Because when I came up here, I saw an advertisement in the hospice that they wanted volunteer biographers and they offer the service to people, to their clients. And I thought, great, I'd like to do that. I'd like to hear about people's lives. My husband was horrified because he said it was going to be very depressing and he had to live with me. <laughs> um, I said, don't worry, if it doesn't suit, if I'm volunteered, I'm sure I can unvolunteer. So I pulled out. And after doing about reading, being surrounded by books as a child, um, my mother wrote um, articles and sent them overseas, had them printed in pen magazines and things like that. Um, and I had a vivid imagination, so I guess when you put all of that together, I felt comfortable writing, I think, mm. but certainly um, I was happy to go and volunteer and learn about other people's lives and write that down for them, and that's what started me on. Uh, but I did um, uh, glean information from other specially published authors around Whangarei, so I could figure out, actually, try and figure out how to do it, and join three different writing groups. Um, yeah. Yes, <laughs> we start. <laughs> Caroline, which groups and which authors were most helpful around Friday night? Um, Kate, um, who has um, written a book, unfortunately, I joined up that group before I discovered she'd written a book um, with the title that I would have liked to have used. <laughs> um, which was? Um, a Country Cop 24-7 about, um, um, get, what's his first name? Bemi, um, who's now a counsellor here, um, who funnily enough um, had sort of overlapped and had something to do with the man that I landed up writing the book for Quinn. But um, certainly other people um, who have, um, like um, Darren, um, who's, um, genre is all about dragons um, and has written many books um, and is a brilliant uh, critiquing person um, and you don't want to go to any meetings with her unless you've got very thick skin <laughs> um, because she's very good at pulling it apart completely um, and there were other people too but all um, there's a lot of very clever writers in Whangarei, and I was amazed. Mm. And yeah, Stephen, how? I, think, um, I was going to be a teacher, started writing some cricket notes for the local newspaper, running short of money, and uh, through various means ended up starting as a journalist. I hated writing, I hated writing the deadlines, but I needed to pay the rent, and need to uh, get some beer money. Um, and I managed to move into television within a couple of years. And I found a place in television because the pictures told the story. Television, news, sport, and the programs that I've done, um, the words were not peripheral, but the vision was the most important element. So th that kept me going while travelling. And it was only when uh, our children left home uh, a couple of years ago, they were scattered around the world. My wife and I were ships in the night passing, never seeing each other. I said, This is crazy. We've been talking about going overseas and doing another big tour uh, when I retire. Why don't we do it now? That was the end of 2016, start of 2017. I said, why don't we do it now? Because we don't know what's going to happen in 2020. <laughs> <laughs> so I quit my job, took my wife and quitting her job. We sold the house and bought a, a motorhome. Um, so we had a little bit of time before we could take off on the trip. And it was literally just having free mind and spare time. And an idea came to me for the story for, for Tungus Mob. And it was based on 
a game we used to play on the buses when I was a tour guide. We used to call it Killer. So you'd be sitting around at night um, and wanting to entertain the passengers, so you pick someone to be the killer, and they would have to wink at someone without everyone else watching. And so it just became a little fun game you'd play on the bus. Sometimes it got quite extreme. You'd go a couple of days, you'd have people dying underneath the Eiffel Tower, frothing at the mouth because it'd be poison. Well, the French say, oh, sacred blood. What did you call it? <laughs> so it was very entertaining. And I just thought, well, what if someone took that seriously? and start killing passengers. And I thought, well, that'd be interesting. But then I realised, given the PC days, no, the tour would be finished, everyone would disappear, become a crime scene, and all fall apart. And I thought, well, what if something happened back in those days when I was a tour guide, but wasn't discovered until the present day? And so that formed the basis for Tugger's Mob. Judy Williams was a Kiwi girl going off in a big OE. Everyone goes on a bus trip, uh, London, Paris, Istanbul, Gallipoli, um, along the way she's subjected to sexual harassment from one of the other passengers but in the 80s. No one wants to create waves to make a fuss. Uh, she was ignored or just you know, swept under the carpet. Um, she dies. Um, no one thinks it's suspicious until they discover her diary 30 years later. Because in the 80s no one travelled with mobile phones and cameras. It was all done in the diary. So, um, I just got into the story and suddenly I found fiction so liberating for being a journalist. I enjoyed writing and I was literally writing in different campsites. There's one thing from journalism that um, you had to work under pressure, you had to learn to write with everything going crazy around you at times. I could zone out and focus on the writing and that's what happened. That's why my wife would get annoyed with me saying, can we please leave or can we please get off this ferry? You sit You've been writing there for two hours, you know, we need to go see Europe. <laughs> I'd be keen to hear your thoughts on this. So, I'm a journalist as well, and from what I've encountered, journalists don't interact with creative writing much at all, like fiction writing, and fiction writers know next to nothing about journalism, to generalise. What are your thoughts on that? And very much so. Um, certainly journalism is very formulaic, you know, who, what, when, where, why. Newspapers, uh, but I, that's where I started, you, know, you wrote 20 centimetres, overran on the stone, chopped the last 10 centimetres off. And television, you had to have a story with a beginning, a middle and an end. If you're given two minutes or you're given two hours, you had to work to that duration. So if television probably gave me a good background to do the whole story. Writing Tugs Mob, I was thinking in visual elements. I had Europe as my palette. Time and whatever. So... Without sounding too much like a nut bar, it was... I've, I've, I've heard other people say, and I don't know whether you guys are the same, but sometimes you can get sort of into a zone where you start writing, and it's almost like someone's channeling through you. And it's quite an odd feeling, and I remember the first time it happening was at school. And I was good at English, and I read a lot, but... I didn't actually write an awful lot. And we'd been studying, I think it was about sixth form, and we'd been studying ballads. And we had to write a ballad, and we had about four weeks to do it. I wrote mine in the morning tea time before it was supposed to be handed in. because, And it was weird, because it just sort of came. Um, so when Hennessy sort of made an appearance, uh, she just took me along with her, really. Mm. I didn't, I she's, didn't she's take a real, her, she She's a real me. person. Yeah. That's the thing, the characters become real. Yeah. You find their voice and they carry you and, and guide you. You're thinking, you know, mm -hmm. uh, two of my characters, 20-year-old women, I've got a couple of daughters. Three daughters are in their 20s at the time. What does a 60-year-old man know about 20-year-old girls? But their voices were coming through to me. It's, it's an interesting sensation. <laughs> Uh, I had a, for a bit of promotion, I had a face mask, uh, a COVID mask made up, I saw one cheaply on an American website, so that the front cover of Tiger's Mob made up, so I can see my... Um, so can you name, um, so you've named Darren, and can you name some other people who you might have heard of or might need an introduction for, who have, you know, been like a magnet helping you get towards the, the final goal? Um. With writing, I think it's just been 
the support of lots of people rather than just one and going to the um, writers um, not festival, whatever it is. Yeah, North, North, North Rock, Rock. Yes. Festival, yeah, yeah. Barge Park, yeah. Um, that was amazing, meeting a lot of writers there. Um, so I think it's really been a, a combination and, and, and finding out at North Wright that there were some great writers there and it was truly amazing, but they were actually just ordinary people like me. Um, and so they weren't up on a pedestal or anything and that was good. And I've really enjoyed going to the Writers' Festival down in Auckland very much. Um, yes, there, there have been quite a few. Yeah. But you see, I'm old writers. Um, and I was just telling my husband, um, um, a well-known Australian writer who, made, made, um, who wrote um, A Good Keen Man, and he was a bit surprised to hear that I had known him. And, some past years. And, yeah, it's all sort of added up, which is what happens when you get old. You accumulate lots of different um, experiences and people in your life. I was asked by another of the cops who had been there, please don't put his name in, um, because he's still not in a good way all these years later. So it, things can affect people and even if they're made up to write a story. Um, but I think it's just a matter of being careful and, and in my case, being very, very careful, yes, respectful. And, and if you, I mean, when I read a story and it's a novel and it's all a whodunit and there's lots of blood and gore, it doesn't affect me because it's a novel, I know it's a novel. If I read a story that I know is for real, and you can still have lots of blood and gore, then it's much more likely to affect me. So yes, respect, I guess, is a big word. Um, that was probably a good, safe parameter when it came to crime fiction. Um, in Tudor's Mott, there's, it's a work of fiction, but a lot of it based on anecdotes of things that happened while on tour. Uh, the person Tugger Tancred was um, inspired by was actually real. He's now dead. Supposedly went off the back of a ferry in Hong Kong Harbour in the mid-90s. I buy every book I wanted to read, so I use the library a lot. Uh, I think you get to know within the first few pages or the first chapter, you know the way the book looks likely to be going. You know by the writing, um, how graphic perhaps it may be. Um, you can tend to sort of pick that up quite quickly. I know there are a couple of themes that I prefer to stay away from. Um, so I, if I come across one of those in something I'm reading, uh, I, I tend to either skip them or stop reading and I, I figure, you know, um, that's just my thing. Uh, I love reading whodunits and real life crime stories. I must suffer from not being an investigator. Perhaps if I had joined the police force I may not have become the voracious consumer of crime fiction and non-fiction, the twisty tales and the sometimes gory discoveries. It must be Enid Blyton's fault. The <laughs> early diet of Secret Sevens, the famous fives and more meant I looked forward to an exciting future, making sure the goodies were safe and the baddies were severely dealt with. <laughs> As it's turned out, my life's certainly not been boring, but I have seldom had a chance to catch the baddies. There were some interesting meetings with kind policemen when the different teenagers did some dumb things. Mm -hmm. I mean, stealing cigarettes because one didn't get enough pocket money. <laughs> the judge thought that was amusing. Another teen was sent an envelope of marijuana seeds from a boyfriend in Brisbane with my address on the front <laughs> and his return address. 
I have never quite recovered from three large men and a dog searching my home. I don't think that boyfriend was the sharpest knife in the drawer. <laughs> then there was the illegal joyride in my husband's company van. I'm sure all his mates were delighted to be driven halfway across Auckland to a party and back. But on Monday morning, my husband found the cases of costume jewellery had mysteriously changed position while we were away for the weekend and some of the seats and carpet were wet. Obviously, it had rained while the sunroof was open. We took this 16-year-old down to the local police station after talking to the duty constable first. He was given a very firm lecture and has never put a foot wrong since. The last child, thank goodness, was a teenage Gothic rebel. Aged about 17, the Gothic gang from her university arts course wanted to support a band playing in the Auckland Town Hall, but they had no money to get in. At about nine o'clock at night, we were phoned to please report to the Auckland Central Police Station. That is not the sort of phone call a parent wants to receive. Apparently, the Goths had climbed up the fire escapes, got onto the roof area of the Town Hall, and could watch the concert from on high. <laughs> they must have been seen by someone and arrested. At least they didn't fall through onto the stage. We were allowed to take her home after some further questioning and reprimanding. So you see, none of my children made real crimes, but I did get to meet some nice policemen. <laughs> I was pretty close to my dream when I was employed to man the office of a private detective. It was a small, dark room upstairs in Newmarket, and I was to take messages when calls came in as the one-man investigator was out most of the time investigating. The first day was quite scary. A man on the phone told me to give my boss a message that he was coming to get him with a gun. <laughs> most of the agency work was proving adultery, the only way at that time to file for divorce before seven years of marriage. It was sleazy work carried out by a sleazy man, usually <laughs> creeping around at night with a camera. I only lasted six weeks. The crunch came when I went with him down to Tauranga for the weekend, as he had a divorce job to do there, and he would take me out to work with him. He would organise private hotel accommodation. I would have no costs to worry about. When we arrived, I found he'd booked only one double room, and that was his expectation for the weekend, not mine. I organised a single bed and gave him notice as soon as he'd delivered me back home. So I couldn't even learn to be a private investigator, but I did have one weekend of spying on people in the dark, and I felt dirty doing it. Working for the Department of Corrections was fun, I decided that most crims are just unbelievably stupid. <laughs> However, it was not fun just a few months ago when I was in my home office, not far from here, and heard a rustling coming from our bedroom down the hall. I'd left the sliding door wide open to let some air in. It was safe because the doorway opened onto a very small backyard completely surrounded by fences. I stopped typing to listen to the rustling and went to the door to look down the hall. There was a large young man rifling through stuff on my chaotic dressing table. He looked up. I ran towards him but had nothing to throw or hit him with. I was screaming, how dare you come into our house? Get the fuck out. <laughs> he grabbed a couple of things off the bed and raced out that open door with me yelling and chasing him. As he ran around one side of the house, I went back through the hallway, picked up the phone as I went, saw him jump over the side fence and run down our driveway. So I was off after him, yelling my head off and trying to punch 111. A neighbour came out to investigate. The robber threw the stolen things down. I ran, yelling all the time, but he was about 60 years younger than me and obviously fit.
<laughs> Unfortunately, I'd picked up the landline in my haste, and the further away I ran, the less, of course, it would work. <laughs> However, he was picked up by the police a few houses down the road, and I was interviewed by another nice policeman. My youngest daughter, the goth one, was horrified when I told her about my exciting morning, and she said, Mum! You're supposed to run away from a burglar, not run towards him. Of course, I was furious that he was in our house. Flight or fight? Obviously, I fight. So you're looking at a frustrated crime detective who intends to continue to keep a messy dressing table just to confuse any burglars. Of course. <laughs>